Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, I may. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Remember Brother Wayne. Wayne said to remember him in prayer. Remember Linda, him and Linda both. Also, Sonny. Um, they've carried him to the hospital. Something about his heart with chest pains. He needs our prayers. And uh, also, some upcoming events. You know that Reverend Larry Rowland will be here next Sunday morning ministering at the 11 o'clock hour. Let's pray for him. It's July 31st. And let's remember revival with the Brickies beginning uh, August the 7th through the 10th. So let's remember that. Also, 96 CH Church has got Tony Porter coming August the 15th through the 19th. That'll be the week after our revival. So remember that. If you're able to get up there and support them, do so. Brother Tony will also be preaching our homecoming in uh, September. So let's remember all those events. Is there a request behind me? Cousin, yes. Amen. Praise God. September the 8th, okay. Let's remember that. Richard's working. I don't know where others are, but uh, whatever their needs are, I pray that God will meet their needs. Would you stand all over the house? Travis, if you would, stand to take us to the Lord. If you have an offering, put it in the back pan, please. In Jesus' name, go ahead. Yes, Almighty God, minister in the house to see the Lord. God, we need you. We know every day of our life that we need you. We cannot do it without you, Lord, for you are our refuge and our strength. You are a very present help in time of trouble and sorrow. You are a victory and our joy. God, you've heard the requests and the needs that have been brought up in the house of God. I pray that every need be met. We call forth healing into the bodies of those who are sick and afflicted. We know that we serve a healing God. We call forth deliverance to those that need to be delivered. And in the name of Jesus, because of the blood of Calvary, we pray for the upcoming services, the revival, and different things that are coming up. And God, we're like placing them in your hands that many souls might come in to the kingdom. Touch every need here. The need that Shannon told me about, Father, the gentleman that had a heat stroke. We pray for him and lift him up before you, God, tonight. Touch our singers and our musicians, Lord, and minister through them and use them in this house tonight, we pray. Have your way in this service. We'll be ever mindful to praise you and to glorify you. For it's in the name of Jesus that we ask it. Amen and amen. Let's worship tonight. Do oh, magnify the Lord. Glory to God. Sing with them. Oh, magnify the Lord. For he is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord. For he is worthy to be praised. Oh, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation.
anything for you. Come on, church. Travis, what did he do for you? He woke you up. Feel him in my hands. Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's not true. I don't know what you feel tonight. 
Amen. Give the Lord another hand. Praise God. You ready for the word? We want to talk tonight about the shaking and the harvest, but let me pray first. Father, thank you tonight for Calvary. Thank you, Lord, that for this time and this season in our lives, Father, we're where you would have us to be. You've brought each of us together here, Lord, and there's a purpose and there's a reason for all things. We realize, God, that we're closer to your coming than we've ever been before. And God, we need to prepare to meet you at any moment. Help me tonight. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Take that live coal from off the fire of the altar of God. Place them up on my lips of clay tonight that I might speak as your oracles. Help me, God, to remember the things I've learned and studied of you. And let me speak nothing, God, except what you would place within my spirit and my mind to do. And the church says... Amen. Talking about the shaking and the harvest. We're coming out of Hebrews 12 for our scriptures, 25 through 29. Go ahead if you would, girls. It says, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if, this is talking about the Lord speaking. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall, they, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And the church says, amen. The shaking and the harvest. Let me say as I begin tonight that there are a lot of people and they're going through pressures and they're going through situations and a lot of people in our world are living in fear. And I believe that a lot of what's taking place in lives and in homes tonight actually has to do with with the end time harvest cycle. God is shaking things because if we're ever going to get them in, we're going to have to get them in. Because I do believe this is going to be the last swoop to get in the harvest. And when I'm talking about harvest, I'm talking about souls tonight. We all know that our nation and a lot of people are under a spirit of oppression a lot of them are living under a heaviness. And in some, it's like there's a spirit of hopelessness in our world that we live in. I do not know how people make it who do not have the Lord because he's our hope and he is our strength, we that know him. And Proverbs 13 and 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Have you ever had hope in something and then all of a sudden that hope was taken away. It, it makes you what I call heart sick. It does. You can become heart sick. And if you don't have God, that thing can weigh you down. But I want to read James 5, 7 and 8. And I want to understand a little bit about what God is doing in the last days concerning the harvest. He said, Be patient, therefore, brethren, Unto the coming of the Lord. He said, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and he has long patience for it, until he receives the early and the latter rain. And in the natural, that would be the rain that brings in the harvest. Of course, we're talking spiritual tonight. But ye also be patient, establish your hearts, 
For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The Bible said that we're living in the time of what I call the harvest cycle. You know, there's seasons that take place. There's a time to plant, there's a time to water, there's a time to pull down, there's a time to do all things. But we're in the end time season of, of the only chance we're going to have left to bring in the harvest. If we're going to get them in, Sister Disher, now's the time. And the scripture reading in the book of Hebrews that I began with is important because it predicts a shaking that is going to occur at the time of the end, and also in the heavens and the earth. I believe that this shaking, I'm going to call him the, almost like birth pangs. This is not tribulation, don't get me wrong on that. But it's the birth pangs that's leading into the tribulation period. But I believe a lot of this stuff has already started. And I do believe with all my heart that this world is being set up for the one world dictator, for the Antichrist to appear upon the scene. And I believe a lot of our political stuff that's going on is playing right in to the hands of the enemy to cause this to take place. But this period that I'm talking about, the shaking and the birth pains, is going to culminate in the time of the tribulation period. But it's already taken place to a degree. We're seeing tsunamis, we're seeing earthquakes, we're seeing volcanic eruptions and floods and fires and hurricanes and tornadoes. Well, Sister Luke, I, I thought that's always been some of them there has, uh, but I'm talking about they're all happening at one time globally all over the face of the earth. That's the difference in it, all at the same time. And it's getting worse and worse, and church, it's not going to get any better. This old earth is being brought to a, a disheaval. It's being destroyed from inside out because we're soon to get a new world that we're going to be living in. There's coming a shaking. Is the devil doing it? No, not really. He's being used, but he's not the one doing it. Is the world doing it? No. Who's doing it? God is doing it. God is going to bring this shaking that's about to take place. It's already begun. But the main shaking that is to take place will come from God himself. And he's going to shake everything. And if it's not right, it's going to be, it's going to be killed. It's going to die out. It's going to be exposed. So that what that is, that that is right will remain. Listen, things are coming out of the closets. It's never come out of the closets. Political issues are being brought forth. Sin is being exposed. Things are taking place all over the world, but if that did not happen, how would we expose the sin that's taking place? If we don't expose, if God doesn't expose it, we don't see it, then how can it be put down? It's been hid for so long. But we're seeing things come to light. Even the churches are being shaken. Ministries are being shaken. The real from the false is being brought forth. And that which is right and real will stand. We don't have to worry about what's going on in this world. Because you and I, if we're right with God, this shaking is going to take place. But we're still going to be standing when it's over with, standing in the power of the Almighty God. But I want to look at something to get a clue about the harvest and the shaking. In Matthew 13, 24 through 26, there's a parable put forth and it says the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. Now remember tonight, we are talking about the shaken and the harvest. 
Now the good seed is the children of God and the kingdom that are saved by grace of God. Are you part of that good seed tonight? I believe that you are. The tares represent the children of the wicked one. Those that are not saved. The enemy that sowed them in the tares are called a tear that sowed them in among the wheat was the devil. The harvest is the taking place at the end of the world. And the reapers are going to be the angels. And Jesus gives us the commentary about this parable. They were sowed, the Bible said, while men slept. He said, men slept. We're in a time, children of God, when the church is asleep. Come on. It reminds me of the ten virgins. Do you know all ten of them actually slept? Five of them had been wise enough to keep enough oil in their vessels that when they woke up and needed it, it'd be there. But really, all of them were sleeping. And we're living in a day and age when you look at the church world as a whole. Now, God's got good people. God's got good churches. Don't get me wrong. But as a whole, as we look back over the years that have come and gone, the church world has been asleep. And they have let the tear come in. And it's been sowed among the wheat. And we've got such garbage going on in a lot of our pulpits in America and around the world that it's not even funny. He said, while men slept, while the church has been sleeping for years. Now, let me ask you, said the enemy came and sowed tares. What is a tear in the natural? It is what's called, it's actually a type of something called rye grass. And it's known as the bearded darnel, like you would wear a beard because of the way it looks. The bearded darnel, D-A-R-N-E-L. And in its early stages, if they had a field out there with weed in it, in the early stages... It's absolutely indistinguishable from the wheat. You cannot tell it from the wheat. The wheat and the tear look absolutely alike. They have the same stalk, the same leaf, the same color, the same appearance, but it's different in its nature Because the wheat or the good seed produces a kernel that is edible by both man and animal. But this Darnell uh, tear, on the other hand, has a head on the top of it and it's full of tiny black seeds and they're poisonous. If you eat them, they can cause nausea, They can cause convulsions, and ultimately you eat enough of them and it'll cause death. One of them is healthy, the other one is not. The tares are called, they're described as a dangerous plant. But let me interject something here about the wheat. And and I'll get to the fact that the only way you can distinguish them is at harvest time. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But I want to make a difference in them in the wheat. And I want to get to that in just a few minutes. But let me say something first. There are things that are being presented from the tear to the body of Christ that the children of God are eating that are absolutely detrimental to them spiritually. There are false doctrines taking place. There's all kinds of garbage in the church world. 
It has absolutely no spiritual benefit, no spiritual edification. It's weighing people down. It's causing them to live a lifestyle of sin and justify it to their own selves. And it's called tares. Sowed in among the wheat. So we know that according to Jesus, that there's tares within the body. Now I'm, I'm talking about the whole body of Christ worldwide. Worldwide. This thing has taken place. How did the tear get there? Because people, I'll say it again, spiritually have fallen asleep. They've got lazy in the church. They have quit coming to church. A lot of churches, they do good to have one service a week. And it's laziness, a lot of it is. They've quit praying, they quit fasting. They've got stuck in just a routine. And listen, it's disheartening when you have a church and your people don't come. It is. It's very disheartening. They have no concept of what it takes to study and to prepare and to pray and to do everything that a pastor would have to do in order to feed the sheep. And then though there are those, Sister Disha, that are able to come, and yet they refuse to come. They have every excuse in the world. I'm not being mean tonight. I'm just stating the fact, church. I'm stating the fact. But people have quit worshiping. They've quit fasting. And the devil came right in the front door of the church and sat down. And because they could not discern any longer... Our pulpits are filled with people that are ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. Can they be saved? Oh, yes, they can. But if they're saved, they're going to change their ways. Okay? But they're allowing practicing individuals to do these things. It's going on all over America. Now, let me say this. Sometimes... A tear is there, and folk do know it's there. I'll guarantee you, even though it's indistinguishable until harvest time, I'll guarantee you that if the pastor is prayed up in that church, they know who the tear is. They know exactly where that tear is, okay? Well, here's the problem. Every church has got them. And you might say, well, Sister Luke, why don't you just kick them out? First place, I don't kick anybody out. But the thing about it, there's a problem. And the parable tells us about it. He said, in this parable, the men went to the owner and said, would you let us go and pull the tare out of your field? And the owner said, no, you can't do that. Because if you do, you're going to tear up the good wheat along with the tear. And I've watched it over the years. When you have a, a field and there's wheat and tear are in there too. It's the root that's important. Because the root of that tear underneath the ground intertwines with the root of of the wheat. And if you go in there and you're going to pull up the tear, what's going to happen is the roots are intertwined with the wheat and you're ultimately going to pull up some good stuff along with the bad. So the parable and God says, leave them alone. He'll do the separating at the time of the harvest. But isn't it strange? Now, if you've ever been in a church where people cause trouble, where there's a tear there, I don't know any church in the world hadn't experienced it sometime or other because the enemy puts the tear in among the wheat. But anytime you've got a troublemaker, 
I'm taught not just leave them because God tells them to leave, but a troublemaker, and they ultimately leave the church. Isn't it amazing? They'll always take somebody with them. They'll take other families with them. Why? Because that tear had become rooted together underneath in the ground behind the scenes and the reason God is going to send a shaking that's predicted in the book of Hebrews is there is a principle in the word of God about separation at the time of the end. God is going to do a separating. There's tares everywhere. Our nation would not be in the shape it's in if the tare were not sowed among the good wheat. And it's getting to the place the tear are almost taking over the wheat. But I've got to declare to you tonight that the God that I serve still has a church. The church, the church, the true born again believer is still alive. They are well on planet earth. And God has a remnant. It's not a certain denomination. It's not a denominational thing. But it's born again believers out of ever uh, born again church. And they are going to be here till the end. And God has still got a church that he's going to use. They're full of power. They're full of anointing. They're being used by God. And the devil is a liar tonight. And the shaking is revealing him everywhere so that God's people will be able to fight against them. But in the last days, Brother David, there's coming a separation. The wheat from the tare, that's Matthew 13. There's coming separation, the Bible said, from the profitable and the unprofitable servants. That's Matthew 25 and 30. There's a separation of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. There's a separation of the man at the wedding that didn't have on the proper wedding garment. That's Matthew 22 and 1. And we in America tonight are seeing a shaking politically, economically, socially, and there's going to be a shakeup in the religious area that has already begun in major denominations. We're seeing the tear setting in pulpits that are being revealed for what they really are and they're not standing for the true word of God anymore. And there's coming a separation and God himself is going to reveal the true from the false. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me see where I am in this thing. There's about to be a shaking, and it is not coming from the devil, and it's not coming from the world, but it's coming from God. And let me explain how this principle operates, and I want to bring it down uh, to basically, uh, let's, let's see if we can compare it to like the local church. But I also want to use some things, how the principle operates, and I want to go back and into the Old Testament, just bring out a couple of things and compare this. As far as, remember the word separation. God is doing a separation. In the Old Testament, let me go back and add this, he's doing it to bring in the harvest. Now, who are the harvests? Tell me. Lost souls. Souls is a harvest. He's wanting to bring in a harvest. Now, in the Old Testament, they had seven major feasts and festivals, okay? There was Passover. There was unleavened bread. There was first fruits. There was Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Three of those Every man from the age of 20 years and older were required by God to come to Jerusalem to celebrate those feasts. Now, th three of those feasts were the ones they had to actually come to. Let me go ahead and say this. 
Within those seven feasts, I'm going to throw this in as a side line, as Richard says, a rabbit trail. Within those uh, feasts and festivals, you've got the whole plan of salvation. God put it in the Old Testament. It was a type and shadow. There's no excuse why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those people did not know who Jesus was. There was no excuse. He said, I didn't come to change or do away with. He said, I come to fulfill. And when it comes to Passover, we know that that represented salvation. You know, if I see the blood, I'll pass over you. At the time of Passover, Jesus, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, was being killed on the cross of Calvary. Right at the very time that the lambs in Jerusalem were actually being slain. That evening, which they count as their next day, but it was evening, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that was at that moment, Jesus Christ was taken down off the cross and he was buried. In Israel, every family at that time would bake bread and they would reach into the center part of that bread and they would hide the center part of that bread somewhere in their house. Okay? That happened at unleavened bread. The next feast was on the third day from the day he was crucified and it's called first fruits and that's when he arose from the dead. That was one of the feasts that they were required, it was a harvest feast. What did Jesus do when he went down into the pits of hell? He preached to the departed saints, and when he come out of there, what did he bring with him? He got the keys of death and hell in the grave, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the saints of God were in a compartment there called paradise. He went and unlocked paradise, all the saints of God from the beginning of time who died looking to the cross were carried out of there and taken and presented to the Father as the first fruits of the harvest. It was a harvest festival. Fifty days late after first fruits was Pentecost. I've got to hurry. What was Pentecost? It was a harvest festival. What happened, it was the beginning really of the church age when the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. And when that happened, how many souls got saved when Peter preached? 3,000 souls. It was harvest. And from that time to now, souls and the harvest is still being brought in. Okay? The next one that we're looking for, and, this, and then I'll quit, I won't get to the rest of them, it's called the Feast of Trumpets. We're waiting on the Feast of Trumpets. That is going to be the time of the rapture of the church. And that's what it represents. But within these feasts and festivals, God put the whole plan of salvation in there. And those three that they were commanded by God to attend, all three of those festivals were harvested festivals, okay? Passover was a time of the barley harvest. You had Pentecost was the wheat harvest. Now this is in the natural. This is the way they really celebrated it. And then you had what was called at the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Tabernacles, the grape harvest. So I'm saying all that to get you to the point that harvest is important. It was celebrated. And for us, it represents souls. Okay? So the harvest is vital. And we want to look tonight in the natural of what went, what happened, what took place at a harvest when they planted it. Okay? You can plant a seed in the ground. You can watch that seed grow. But there's some things that have to be done at harvest time that's not so much fun to do. When it comes to the barley harvest, three things had to be done to that barley to harvest it. 
when it come to the um, wheat harvest, three things had to be done to harvest it. When it come to the grape harvest, three things had to be done to the grapes to harvest them. And in the process of harvesting, you've got harvesting, you've got threshing, and you've got winnowing when it comes to the wheat harvest. And that's what I want to talk about. Harvest is when you have to go into the field. If I'm going to say I'm going to harvest some wheat, I'd like to picture a stalk of corn. I can see corn better than I can wheat. And I want to go out there and I want to harvest some wheat. I, Cookie, I've got to go into that field. And I've got to go in there and I've actually got to s cut down the stalk and I've got to separate that stalk of that corn or that wheat and take it out of that field and put it into the barn or the storage area where I can finish harvesting it. The first step is that you've got to get it out of the world. You've got to go out and find that lost soul and you've got to get them out of where they're at out there and bring them in where they can be dealt with and taught and finish that harvest process. Y'all with me? God is saying that people need to come out of the thinking of the world system. We're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. And we don't think like the world thinks. And we have got to stand up and stand apart and let our position be made known. And we got to come out from among them. Be a separate people, saith the Lord. Touch not that unclean thing. And I will receive you. But there's a separation in the harvest process. You first got to get separated from the world. The wheat had to be separated out of that field and brought forth. Y'all with me? I'm old-fashioned, but I do not understand how people who profess to be Christians can look at the filth that they watch on television, listen to the name of God and Jesus Christ being blasphemed, and it not bother them. You see, there's things, there's things, uh, there's folk, let's say it this way, in the body of Christ... They get drunk, they party, and then they come to church on Sunday, and they don't feel a bit bad about what they did. But worldliness is showing up everywhere. They are not separating themselves from the worldly things that are out there. And what's happening is, there is so much junk. There's so much tear in the body of Christ. So the first thing in the harvest of the wheat and the barley itself is where the owner of the field, remember the husbandman, God is the owner of the whole field. And he goes into that field and he takes the entire stalk of wheat and he separates it from the field and he brings it in. So y'all clear on that? The field literally is the world system out there. And if we are good, if we are the good seed, and we're in the house of God, that also tells me and verifies that there's also tares sowed in among the wheat. So that tells me there's also Stuff that has to be done and looked for within the church. I believe tonight that God is going to have a people. I'm going to say that again. I don't want anybody to think that I'm belittling the church. God is not dead, people. The God we serve is powerful. And if we will live for him and people would turn to him, there's nothing that our God won't do for them. 
But we're living in a world that is blinded. We're living in a world where, like I said, a lot of the church has been asleep and the tares have slipped in and they've come in and the tares are convincing the rest of the people or a lot of the people there that they are what's right and they're not because they look just like the wheat. You know they come to church every now and then. They carry a Bible under their arm. You know they say that they are Christians. Uh, they look just like the wheat. Okay? But the first thing, there has to be a separation out of the world, out of the field. And then the second thing is what's called threshing. A threshing floor. The grain, the barley and the wheat had what was called a head on the stem of it when it was cut down, okay? The threshing is done when you separate the grain from the wheat and from the stem. You brought the whole stalk in, the whole stem in. Now you got to take the wheat away from the stem. Y'all with me? And you got to thrash it. It's called a thr thrash it or thrash. How y'all say that? Threshing, thrashing for Okay, y'all know what I'm talking about anyway. But there comes a time that even when you get out of the field and come into the house of God, let's just bring it down to the church, there still has to be a separation, people. Sometimes God said, I've got to separate you from the things you're familiar with, the things that you have grown comfortable with. you got to come out of your comfort zone and you got to begin to follow him, and he's going to take you to some places you've never been before, and he needs to shake up some stuff out of your life because you need to be part of the end time harvest, and even though you were brought out of the field and brought into, let's say, the house of God, you still got some junk in your life and some stuff in your life that's got to be taken out of there in order for you to be part of the end time harvest. He'll shake us up. He'll cause things to take place in our life to where we have to look at our own life. But that's called thrashing the wheat. And the third thing is called winnowing. And they would take a wooden, I'll call it a pitchfork. It was made kind of like a pitchfork. And what they would do, they would separate that grain, and it was called chafe. It was an outer shell. You know how you peel a, is it a peanut? You got to peel that shell off that peanut in order to get to the inside of that. That's what it, it wasn't that kind of a shell, but that's an example. That outer shell has to come off of there, okay? And they would winnow that. They would get a pitchfork that wouldn't throw it up in the air, throw it up in the air, and the chafe would be blowed away, but the good stuff would fall down to where they could keep it. Y'all with me? Okay. Now, none of that took place until the wheat matured. as a, It was at harvest time. Remember, you separate the wheat from the field. You separate yourself once you get into the house of God from familiar things, your comfort zones, you know, my, it's like coming in and, and, you know, it's always been my bench, so I'm just going to sit there. That's just an example, you know. And, and God says, no, don't sit at that bench no more. Sit at that other bench. Now, it goes deeper than that, but I'm just giving you an example. Well, I'm comfortable over here, God. Yeah, but you're not moving over here. Get over here so you move. You know, it's to, it's to stir you up. It's to get you uh, not be bogged down with the junk of the world. But anyway, there's some things I want to bring out here. But God has got you and I, and we are the good seed. The people of God are the good seed. And after we've been thrashed, have you ever felt like you've been thrashed? Have you, after you've had that winnowing, when you feel like you're blowing in every direction, don't know which way to go, what to do. But God does that to blow some of that junk off of us. Because I'm telling you, church, this world is full of junk. This world is full of tear. And God wants us to use this right here as a guideline, people. This right here is what we follow. 
We don't eat anything. We, everything is not like this word has to fall off of us. And whatever it takes, God's going to see to it it's done. Because God is interested in the harvest. God is interested in souls. And anyway, I want to get to something. I know I'm going long my elbow to get to my knee, but anyway. Some of us, the good seed, I want to say this again. The tear itself, the Bible describes it as being a dangerous plant. We've got some dangerous stuff going on in the kingdom of God, people. We do. If you, if you was to watch some of the mainline, what they call mainline preachers and some of the junk going on, it, some of it makes you sick to your stomach. I'm sorry, but it does. And very few can you find that are standing upon this word right here in the last days, people. They're just not standing on it. And, I, and it makes me sick. I just have to turn it off. But the thing about it is that the tares are a dangerous thing. But I want to interject something about the wheat. Because God compares his people to wheat. First of all, wheat was very... The roots of it, and I told you it's intertwined underneath. But when it comes to wheat, the roots do not go very deep on the wheat. As a matter of fact, it stays just under the ground, and it spreads out six to eight inches, really, on top of the ground. And it's the tear that goes down and wants to pull those weeds, you know, the roots intertwine with them and take it down with them. But the wheat itself does not go very deep. It's shallow. And I thought about that, and, and, and the Lord just showed me the fact that the wheat that he has is not to plant their roots very deep into this world. You see, our roots don't go deep into this earth, Cookie. See, we, our, our roots are to be re really rooted upside down. We're to be an upside down tree. Our roots are really in the heavenlies. Okay? And our branches are down here. But the roots are on the surface. And that wheat, as the wheat of God grows upward, spiritually higher, it dies downward from the bottom up. Did you know that as it dies, that it puts its life into the fruit? The bottom of that wheat begins to die from the ground up, but the more it dies from the ground up, the higher up gets more life and more life because everything in that stalk, it goes to that good wheat and it puts all the nourishment and everything right smack dab into that wheat. Okay? As it grows upward, it dies downward. And then that wheat bends toward the earth. Do you know that as it grows, this is how you can tell the tear from the wheat. When it comes harvest time, when it comes time to go in there and harvest it, as the wheat grows, it's head of that wheat, where the good seed is in the top of it, gets heavier. Do you know that it bows over the wheat will bow over. That is a picture of what you and I need to be. That's humility. That's bowing before God. Now the tear does not do that. The tear stays straight. And that's how you can look at the wheat field and you can tell the wheat from the tear because the wheat is bowing down before God. The wheat is humbling itself. But that tear stands straight up as though it's saying, look at me, I'm it. And in the head of that wheat are those little, or the tear are tiny little black seeds that are in that thing. And they're poisonous. But you can tell at harvest time which is the tear and which is the wheat. And God's coming He's shaking up things. 
and as he shakes up the field and he shakes up and it's harvest time, we're going to see who's going to bow before an almighty God or we're going to see who stands up and say, I don't need you. I can do it on my own. Honey, I want to bow before the God that I serve. I want to be a part of the wheat harvest. Hallelujah to God. But it's easy at harvest time to tell which is the wheat and which is a tear. The difference is not in the stalk. It's not in the leaf. It's not even in the rate of growth. But it's in the fruit at the top of the thing. And the wheat, there's fruit in the wheat, but there's no fruit in the tear. The wheat will bear fruit. You hear me, church? If you're a true stalk of wheat, you will be bearing fruit. Y'all with me? Okay, let me see if I can finish this thing up. I hope I'm making sense. To, sometimes I don't know if I'm making sense to myself. I know what I want to say, but I don't know how to put it out there. If you know what I want to say, if that makes any sense. But the shaking, Judy, you can come off if you want to. The shaking that's taken place in America. America is going through something that the junk is going to be removed. Now there's coming a literal, a literal shaking. Not only of this earth is going to be shook, but the heavens are going to be shaken. It's coming at the time of the tribulation period. All that's going to take place. Horrible things are going to take place. Birth pangs leading up to that is already shaking this earth and this world. Things are being revealed in the natural. But it talks about even the heavens in the natural are going to be shaken. But so are the spiritual elements down in the earth and in the heavens that are going to be shaken. I'm telling you, things are going to be revealed and the, the political world that we're living in are fighting as hard as they can fight to bring this world into their power and into their hold. And they think they're greater than God is. And God's going to show this world that he's still got a church. And his church is going to stand in the end. And all of those terrors are going to be separated out. And the angels of God are going to gather them together. And they're going to be taken and be burnt up. They're going to burn. But God's wheat is going to make it through. And we're going to heaven with the Lord, church. We're going to heaven with the Lord. But if we rooted and grounded in this, do you, do you know what it is that when they're winnowing that wheat and they got that pitchfork and they're throwing it up and, you know, they want that chafe to, to blow away and they want the wheat to drop down so they can gather it in. Do you know what it is that, that separates it when they're doing that? The wind. That's right. The wind. It's the wind that does the separating. Church, you got the, have you got the wind of the Spirit in you? My Lord, have mercy. It, it does the separating process. That wind is blowing. And Travis says the wind of the Spirit blows. It will separate everything. Not like God. Every tear in your life. Everything is not right. It will separate that thing and it will have to come out of there. Stand all over the house. Praise God. It's coming a shaking. It's coming a harvest. And everything not like God is going to fall off. I'm telling you, there's nothing going to be left in this world that's not like Jesus Christ. No sin is going into heaven. No sin anywhere. This world is headed fast end of the tribulation. I, I can almost feel the winds of Armageddon blowing in the horizon. It won't be long, church. And you and I are going home before that ever takes place. But I don't know what we got to go through before we get there. But if there's any junk in our lives, we need to get rid of it. We don't want nothing of this world staying on our lives. And we want to work as hard as we can to bring in the wheat. 
Every stalk of weed out there in that world, go find it. Bring it to God. Let's get them saved. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you tonight for Calvary. I thank you, Lord, that you have made preparation for your people. You're a good God. You, you've told us what's going to take place in the end time. We can't even imagine as we stand there the reality of what's really going to take place when the tribulation period does get here. But God, we're already seeing this world fall apart from the inside out. Our political world is in a horrible shape. We've got terror that's operating our country and our nation. It's hard to find any good wheat in the political world out there. I know there's some somewhere, but it's hard to find. Our churches, God, they're already working to take us off of Facebook and take us off of the YouTube and take us off the TV and not allow any religious programs to be brought out whatsoever. We've got people that stay at home and they ought to be in the house of God. He said, forsake not the assembly of ourselves together, even more so as we see that day approach. But yet our people have fallen asleep and the terrors are moving into their lives and into their homes and taking them over. And if they don't shake it off and do something about it, Lord, they're going to end up being left behind like the five foolish virgins were oh God give us oil in our lamps help us God to stay full of your spirit help us to be prepared whatever day whatever moment you come Lord that next feast and festival the feast of trumpets is soon to take place God and you're going to call your people home help us Lord we pray in this community Help us to be a church and be a haven of rest for the weary traveler and be a lighthouse for a dark and dying world. God, forgive us of every failure, every fault within our lives and help us, God. Search our hearts and try us and know us and see if there be found any wicked thing in our lives whatsoever. For Lord, you're coming back after a church that's pure, after a church that's holy, after a church that's righteous. And God, we want to make it to heaven to be with you in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah.